Welcome to the Lighthouse Conversations, a podcast featuring entrepreneurs and tastemakers from the world of arts, culture, tech, and of course, food. I'm your host, Hesha Montasser. This episode is somewhat unusual, and I'll explain why. You may recall that I had spoken to Yusuf Adib a few months ago. He's the founder of Fatafit, the first Arab TV company that was acquired by global media conglomerate, Discovery. But we're spinning things around this week, and I am the one sitting on the hot chair. Yusuf will be asking the questions from my time as a young trader on Wall Street to how we started the lighthouse in 2017, and why we chose Mall of the Emirates as our second location which he, by the way, was very skeptical about. Hashem, it's really good to be sitting in your seat. And it's a unique pleasure for me to get to know you better. Thank you, sir. Over the next few minutes and, you know, ask Always a pleasure questions. and thank you for doing this. Before I ask the questions, I want to just say that how we met, I want to recall how we met. Sure. And I'll remind you, I don't know if you remember, but... Of course I remember. It started with me walking through Nakhil Mall and seeing this very interesting stand with books and artworks and children's toys and trinkets, etc. And I went to buy a book for my grandchildren, and a young lady told me, well, you know, this is like the lighthouse at D3. This is just a sample of what we have. So I got intrigued. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to see the, the restaurant behind this because it was such a unique selection. Thank you, yes. And, um, And you were closed at the time. Because of COVID. Correct. But two weeks later, this is customer service. Two weeks later, I got a call saying, you had called us <laughs> to come and visit. So uh, it was fun. And then we, we personally met through a, through a chocolate cake. Yes. And I want to add to that. When I saw you the first time, so you had come before, yes. and you had said some very nice things, and the manager uh, knew that. You know, I don't obviously go and talk to every um, customer I have because you want to give them some space. I believe you were with your wife and two friends of yours that day. Yes. But then I saw you around the book stands browsing. And you, were, you had either picked up or picking up the Kaifata series. So I was like, well, this is very interesting because it's a particular series. And it's interesting. We had Maha Ma'moon, who's, who's the co-publisher yeah. on this podcast. So the intended audience was a mixed audience. Uh, also, the intended uh, authors that we would invite yeah. to this uh, series were also mixed. And we felt we'd like to bring uh, a different, uh, like a variety of authors who don't necessarily uh, all inhabit the same circles of production and circulation, and all of this, to bring them uh, in the same series. So we commission authors. That's what we do. We kind of we have a, a certain sensibility that is not necessarily that outspoken or like that rigid uh, or clear to us, but we do share a sensibility in who we would like to in, to invite to the series to to, to write something for Kaisaka. Was I the first person? To- no, no. Many, many have bought them, but I usually they're kind of on the artsy side. There's are. a particular they crowd are. that looks after those, so I usually would know them. And obviously, they had already mentioned you to me, so I was intrigued. Um, and then we got into conversation as you were standing by the by the book stand, and then I came to say hello to your lovely wife and the rest of your friends, and the rest is history, as they say. Yes, yes. So not no, not only are you you know, a founder of a restaurant or co-founder, but you're an art advisor, you're a collector, you're an angel investor, (laughs) and you've spent two decades prior to that in banking and asset management. Before we get to today's world, which is, you know, the restaurant and the experience of that restaurant, uh, how did you end up here? Tell me about those two decades of, you know, you were studying in Boston on a scholarship and then yeah. You got into this world that I really, people have tried to explain it to me, like asset management and banking. And <laughs> to me, <laughs> it's Chinese. Yeah. So I, as you well know, uh, grew up in Cairo. Uh, so I had, a, by all means, I think a very kind of happy and uh, dynamic childhood growing up there. This is the Cairo of the, you know, uh, 80s for the most part and early 90s. Um, my parents had both studied in the States. Uh, they were both academics. My dad is, was a professor of uh, economics. My mother, a professor of English literature. So there, I think, was an interest in arts and culture, primarily from my mother's side, and education in general, uh, always around the dinner table, if you will. I went to a very good school in Cairo, German school. 
a very rigorous program, still is. Um, I did the German Abitur. And then I obviously had the option to either stay in Cairo, go to Germany, or go to the States. We looked into all the options. I went to Germany, and I remember very well going to Munich uh, University, because I thought Munich was a you know, relatively large city, and asked them, how many international students did you have last year? And they said, oh, we had an exceptional year. We had 20 students, globally. That came in. I was like, mm, okay, this is maybe not for me. Uh, the U.S. obviously had a more, or even then, a more diverse student body. So I went up, wind up going to Harvard. Harvard at the time was about 10% international students, and that number has grown over the years. And probably influenced by my dad and his own career and interests, uh, I, I studied economics. Um, in retrospect, there may have been other subjects that I could have done. I think that a liberal arts degree ultimately is more about building a base as opposed to more of a technical know-how. But again, and you know this, growing up in Egypt, we went up going to Handesa al So there was a bit of that influence of you need to learn something that is tangible. You can't go and do French literature. No, that's to be something with a title. With like a, a title. Dr. Mohandas. Well, so with me, they've always struggled because both my parents are professors, as I mentioned, so is my wife. May is Dr. May, Dr. Assam, Dr. Malak, Hatta, my sister, Dr. Alia, and I'm like Mr. Hesh. <laughs> I, I get the mister also you get the mister yeah well, i was not mister yeah, until probably the last five to ten years i think that means i've officially lived abroad long enough to no longer be non-mister so so i think influenced by my dad to some extent i studied economics and that's how i got into banking so i applied like a lot of kids from places like harvard at the time and i wind up um uh landed at merrill lynch this was after university. After university. And, and really, the learning was all on the spot. So, you know, I landed day one. I had to be on a trading floor at 7 a.m., which means you're up at 5. What, what university or studies qualify you to, to trade? I, I don't think any. So you actually wind up doing a series of uh, exams. Your first eight weeks on early Wall Street firm, you go through a very intensive program. There's a great book talks about this by a well-known writer now called Michael Lewis. So you don't actually need any qualification. You do your series seven exams and other exams, and then you're authorized to be on a trading floor. Of course, they don't let you trade at the beginning. So you actually, in my case, Merrill was a huge trading floor, and they give you folding chairs uh, to sit in between the traders. I mean, the traders don't have time for you, don't care about you. You are, if anything, a nuisance. And your job is to say absolutely nothing and watch them. And then maybe find three minutes at some point to ask a question. Isn't there a TV series about this where you see these kids under training and they're really abused by the traders? <laughs> I, I forget on which network it's I mean, from. Maybe, maybe it's HBO series. Yes. Just think, last year. I think that's right. I think in today's terms, probably it may, may, may qualify as abuse. Then it was pretty normal. You had to remember their coffees, specifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to get you the name of that series. It's exactly like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it, so some of that is yeah, true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you learn that way. I once wore brown shoes. They nailed them to the wall as a reminder never to do this again. Brown shoes? Brown leather shoes. They were like, what are you wearing? I'm like, what? Because, you know, everybody looked more or less the same. And uh, they took them from me. Uh, 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 I remember this very well without naming the trader. And he nailed them to the wall. It, it was a bit of a cowboy time. I mean, these were a bit cowboy. And remember, this is at the time when Wall Street were still predominantly white. And very, very male and very testosterone driven. This is 97. Sounds like bullying nowadays, we'd call it bullying. I mean, I think now it's a lot more, yeah, people would be unsafe and bullying. And I'm not belittling any of that. But I mean, honestly, I was never bullied. It was just the culture was that way. And you well, what to, an experience. Yeah. You how how long was that for? That was in total um, almost four years. How, how, at, at the time, how many Egyptians would have gone through that same experience before you or with you? Almost none. I, so, I would have thought so. Yeah, so yeah. at Merrill, so there were the, the Arabs that, that were there were mostly Lebanese and mostly in London. So it was a very defining experience. And I did that for a couple of years. I went, spent some time in London as well on the trading floor there, which is very different. New York was, I think, far more HQ at the time. London grew over time. And then eventually, um, I, the, the dot com boom happened. Um, and I was in New York. And uh, you know, it felt like you had to be part of it. So I started interviewing. A lot of people from Wall Street at that time were doing that at my age. And I wind up at a company called Cosmo.com. There's actually a movie about it. Which, um, um, what year, which So this is, is now uh, 2000. 
late 99, 2000. Okay. Uh, so I went to Cosmo 2000, 2001. And it was fascinating because Cosmo, the, the, one of the, was well, very successful company in terms of the money they raised, which was a big benchmark at the time, but it was in Silicon Alley, not Silicon Valley. And the premise was very simple. Um, anything under your door, uh, anything to your door under an hour. So, but it started with DVDs. That's um, the Netflix model, the original yeah, so Netflix it's, model. It's brilliant. Actually, Netflix model, and it's the Prime model. So when right. you think about right. it, it's Amazon Prime. And Amazon bought a big stake in the company. The company went bankrupt. And obviously, in the last five years, Amazon developed Amazon Prime, which is essentially Cosmo. It was just 15 years too early. Right. The reason I'm mentioning this is any kind of feel for pure entrepreneurship came from that period. I really saw a company from the ground up being built. The company uh, went belly up. I left a few months before. Uh, I was let go as part of cuts as they were running out of money. So I used it as a, as a part of my essays to go to sc school again. I went to business school. Uh, so I went back to Harvard to do my MBA. That was a very interesting period as well. 9-11 happened, and I decided I wanted to leave the States. No, and at 9-11, you were in Boston. I was in Boston. And I felt it was maybe time to, whereas I was toying with the idea to stay in the States, I think I felt like, you know what, maybe it's time, maybe it's a sign I should think about going somewhere else. My, my, my now wife, um, then girlfriend, was uh, in England doing her PhD. So I said, you know, why not move to London? So I graduated and I wound up again on trading floor, but this time in London with JP Morgan. And then, you know, I started feeling, you know, maybe I want to go in a smaller company. And one of my closest friends who was with me in New York at the time had moved to Egypt to work for EFG as head of investment banking. And I knew the founders of EFG. Uh, so, you know, Hassan called me and said, would you be interested in coming? And I said, yeah, but I'm on a trading floor and I do fixed income. What are you looking for? He's like, I'm looking for someone to head up asset management. So I'm like, okay. Uh, and then I called one of my roommates from college. His wife was working at Goldman Sachs in London and invited myself to dinner. And I sat down there and I said, Ira, um, I have a question for you. And I had taken the job, mind you. So what is asset management? She's like, didn't you just take a job and you're leaving, you know, London and going to Dubai or Cairo? To I'm like, yeah. She's like, so you? I'm like, no, nah, I have a sense. So... It was a very different business because I was on this, what they call the sell side, which means you're selling securities, trading securities. This was what's called the buy side, which means you buy securities. And really, in a nutshell, what it is, is you take a bunch of money and you buy either public stocks or private companies or public companies with it for your clients. And we slowly started building a business and that business grew over time. How, how many years were you with the EFG? Um, so 2005 to 2000, end of 2010. So six years in okay. total. Were, were you married at the time? Well, yes. I mean, I, I was married at the very early days of EFG. So marriage and Dubai came Marriage and Dubai time. came, but me and I had been together at that point for, for, for almost 10 years. So we knew each other quite well. And frankly, we lived as roommates. I mean, we didn't live as a married couple. Like she went to work, I went to work. We both hustled, came back. I remember her mom coming on spending week with us. And she was like, this is a, like a strange arrangement. Like, you, you know, we just both like, bye. And then you'll know, come in the evening, have an hour or two together. So, you know, we were just running around. What, what was the trigger that made you, that had you thinking you want to do something for yourself? You want to leave EFG or leave that industry? Yeah, I, I think the first trigger was I started feeling that I wasn't very balanced in terms of the day to day. It was a, a very much, you know, one dimensional in the sense that it was all work, uh, very little balance in that sense. My mother was sick at the time and had uh, uh, cancer, leukemia, and then passed away. And uh, that gave me a bit of pause. And EFG was extremely supportive of that period. It was a hell of a year, that year of 2010. But they were, I have to say, again, we're working for a firm that was maybe Egyptian culturally. I think they understood and they said, if you have to work from New York, you work from New York. And I was traveling back and forth because she was being treated there for almost a year. And I started feeling tired. I started feeling burnt out. And I told EFG, look, guys, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think, I think it's not fair to you or to me to continue at this point. I need to take some time off. And they said, why don't you take time off and come back? I said, no, I want like to have a clean break. If something changes, I'll let you know. So I left at the end of 2010. Uh, and lo and behold, the Egyptian revolution happened. And it was a very strange period. 
I wasn't working, so I was sort of observing everything that was going on. And I was uh, recovering from all of these years, from what happened to my mother. And I think there was a period of six months when I was probably, I don't want to say depressed, but definitely on the verge of, of some kind of depressive phase. I didn't notice until later that for about six months I didn't go out almost at all. Right. Um, so I think it was a difficult period. And I was trying to um, process and I started having those feelings that maybe I would do something other than banking. But I wasn't ready yet. So I actually took another job first. And that's when I realized, you know, my time was, I remember the clock was ticking. I was mentally ready to do something else. Banking has changed, became much more bureaucratic. Um, and I wasn't having fun. So I left, came to back to Dubai for the first time with no job and no agenda. And one of my close friends, the same friends that was with me in New York and EFG said, look, give it six months. If you feel you miss it, you can always go back. So I said, fine, six months passed. And not doing anything. No, not doing it, but thinking about things. So I look, we looked at, and Hany was sort of my brainstorming partner, for you're example. Spe you're speaking of Hany Basuni, so maybe Hany you can Basuni. give us a background of, of Hany Basuni and yeah, how, so Hany, how you met and how you got to know each other. And we met in uh, EFG. Uh, I interviewed him to... But I think it was his second job out of college. Funnily enough, again, my friend Ashraf interviewed him first. He liked him, but Ashraf had a, a, a more democratic system of the whole team had to vote. I'm like, that's a really stupid system. So they voted him down. And then I called him and said, Zico, what happened? He's like, well, you know, I really like this guy, but my team voted him down. We didn't get, do you want to meet him? I'm like, sure. So he came to meet me and I said, well, the good news is if I like you, that's it. He's like, what do you know? I'm like, there's no votes here. It's one vote. Right. Like, I run by Egyptian decree. And it's like, uh, he's like, okay, that's helpful. So I was like, oh, great, you got the job. So he started working with me and uh, we worked for a long time together. I mean, throughout a good chunk of EFG, obviously, he stayed a bit longer than me and then in Doha as well. So we became good friends. Okay. And partners. And we had, we're very different. And I think in that way, we complemented each other. He's 10 years younger as well. But I think there was a lot of confidence, a lot of trust. I started looking at different businesses and I had, you know, we had no background in anything but banking. You know, I wasn't sure. And then one day I went to Cairo and I was a bit frustrated because at that point we're close to a year and I was very uncomfortable with the idea of what, what felt like doing nothing. And May and a lot of my friends remind me, you're not, you're brainstorming, you're approaching different thoughts. I worked, also worked with Equinox for a while. So that wasn't the issue, but I think my nature was as such that I was not used to this and I wasn't comfortable giving myself the space, funnily enough. Uh, and at some point, I went to Cairo, and a good friend of mine sat with me, and I was telling you know, I'm thinking about all these different things. And she said, you know, you seem to like art, and you like culture, and you like books, and you like these things. That's, but you have a point of view. So you should really think about doing something in that regard. And I was like, yeah, but I, you know, I don't want to start like a, a, a gallery or anything like that. That wasn't for me. Let's go back. When did your interest in the arts? I mean, you're obviously at home with professors as parents. Yeah. You were exposed to culture. Yeah. But when did your own personal interest in the arts? It's a good question. It develop? didn't start until college, maybe even later. So my mother, when I would go when I was younger to a lot of art exhibitions in Cairo, and she was also somewhat of a member of a community that, obviously, intellectual academic community that had exposure to the arts. But I, I never took a particular interest. I didn't study in college. Um, there was a little bit of a family background. You know, Mahmoud Saeed was an Egyptian artist, quite well known, was my great uncle. So there was that. Um, and my initial interest came from that and like studying a little bit of Mahmoud Saeed, that era. And would, 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 would you call him the first, his work, the first time you saw art? You know, if you know yeah. what I mean by saw. Like yeah, for you, sure. You saw beyond. For sure. And, you know, Mahmoud Saeed was an Alexandrian, and uh, so he came from that school. And I found his work and then the work of Wanli Brothers and that whole group at the time, especially in Alexandria, very appealing. And I think part of it was is there's nostalgia that I had for that era in Egypt. That era, yes. Uh, and you, when you look at Mahmoud's work, or even uh, the Wanli Brothers, really, and many others, but let's just speak about that. I mean, Wanli Brothers, some of their most famous work are like, you know, ballerina dancers, right? And beautiful, because that's the world they lived in. So to me, it invoked also that element of an Egypt that I felt didn't exist as much. Yeah. I felt that in many ways, we were not getting recognition for the profound uh, addition to culture we've made. 
being at the time a Renaissance man or woman, as many of them were, was completely a given. It wasn't something you had to talk about. Right. It's reflected in their art. I mean, Mahmoud Said's work, he's as comfortable painting Venice as he is the Nile or Aswan. It's hard for us to imagine yeah. now, and now yeah, this exactly. Egypt, that exactly. Egypt. Well, exactly you know, right. Yeah. And I think I felt very strongly that to some extent I was lucky to even in my Cairo and my Egypt, I was surrounded with some of those people. You were blessed, of course. Very yes, blessed. Yes. But that the outside world, especially post-revolution, I mean, of course, didn't look at us as such. No. It was very one-dimensional. And as if, you know, we have to be kind of educated on these things. I mean, you know, and you, you, you've posted a series on, on that as well, showing Gaza back in the day. Very similar story. So there was that nostalgia. And I think my interest in the art came partially from that. So that's world. interesting. It was triggered by Egyptian artists. Yes. My interest really was very Middle East focused. And I studied Middle East history by myself and Harvard reading books that were written by Western academics because I wanted to get a second point of view. Because we had the exposure of growing up there and the exposure of what you read in the history books in school, which were very one-dimensional. And I wanted to get a second point of view and a third which point were very of view. inaccurate in many cases. Some were inaccurate, but some of the Western uh, views were also inaccurate. Of course. And it was a period I grew up in the Sadat era. Um, my family was uh, profoundly changed and affected by the 52 revolution. My great-grandfather was the prime minister when the revolution happened. Really? Under the king. He was the last prime minister. What was his name? Uh, Hassin Siri Basha. And the minister of interior at the time was my grandfather, under him. So the revolution... So uh, you come from a family of Bashawet, yani. On my mother's side. I mean, I, I say that in a good way. No, no, I understand, in yes. Recognition. Yani. Absolutely, absolutely. And literally the revolution happened on their watch. So I was very interested to understand this period better and understand what happened. I mean, oh, I, interesting. a series of things triggered after that. You know, my grandfather passed away very young. My m grandmother had a nervous breakdown. These, these things happened to a lot of families at the of time. Course. So I'm not in any way saying this illicit sympathy. But they happened. But they and happened. And they were tragic. And they were tragic. And they were horrible. And they were horrible. And they were part of Egypt. And there's a whole conversation. And, you know, on the other side, just to give you the full picture, I mean, my father was like many Egyptians, very, very influenced by Abdel Nasser. It's nice that you had both sides. It puts you in a position where you have to... Yes, and there was never learn a thing and, of... Learn and decide. Absolutely, and it was a peaceful coexistence. So I started to try to understand that. And art, culture, was a one window to understand that period. That nostalgic period grounds us. It does that for me as well. For me, certainly it, it does. It shows me there are roots. There yes. are very strong roots that we have. I think that's that right. And maybe in today's world have been you know, erased or forgotten. I think that's exactly right. And one of the reasons I sympathize and gravitate towards a lot of artists, even past this period, that have taken, um, who took archival Im uh, images, appropriated them, manipulated them, made them their own. That work always, so that's mostly for for photography, that work always gravitated. Uh, I gravitated towards. We'll be right back after the short break. Stay with us. I wanted to take a minute and tell you about our friends at Monviso, one of our sponsors who make this show possible. Monviso is founded by an Italian entrepreneur right here in Dubai and has evolved into one of the region's most popular mineral waters sourced directly from the Italian Alps. We immediately connected with the Monvisio's team vision and how giving back is such an integral part of their mission. Through their extensive recycling program and their Take Water, Give Life initiative, proceeds from every bottle of water sold is donated to Al Jalila Foundation to support its education and research. So stock up on still or mineral water by using our exclusive Monviso discount code, Lighthouse10, which you can redeem at store.monviso.com. Once again, the code is Lighthouse10, L-I-G-H-T-H-O-U-S-E, 10. Welcome back. You're listening to a special episode of the show with Yusuf Atib asking the questions. Let's go back to your friend telling you it doesn't have to be a business of a certain yeah. way. You have all these other passions. Yeah, so what she said, which was so interesting, she said, um, so maybe what you just need to do in more kind of, she didn't mean in any vulgar terms, but sort of more bluntly, you need to just monetize taste or monetize your own taste. And something clicked. We have to, put, we have to underline this for a minute. Yeah. 
monetize your own taste. Yeah. It's, just, it's another way of saying only do what you love. Absolutely. So it was very interesting because she gave it a alib, a certain platform or, or umbrella under which to do a lot of different things versus, so it freed me up to think a little bit more broadly versus the thinking of, oh, you should start a restaurant, you should start a cinema, you should start. So I was like, okay, well, then it has to do, so then two things happen. One is admit to yourself it's somewhat subjective. The element of curation came in. You know, you are curating and you are very aware of the fact that you're curating and that's okay. And that's one point of view. That's not the only one, but it's one. But then you also have to live with the risk that whatever you're creating doesn't, does, is not commercially viable. It has, yeah, it doesn't have interest for others. Others. So that was always a risk. Um, so it started under that umbrella, to be honest. We came back, and the first thing that came to mind is fine. When you think about it in these terms, let's get, because I was interested in, in, in design, um, products that we find are not in Dubai commercially that we could sell. So the concept store idea, that's how it started. Okay, actually. more of a training. Yeah, you just start a concept store. I was very attracted to places, mostly were in Europe, uh, but some in Beirut as well, that kind of had an eclectic taste of products, gifting items. And I was like, great, I can do that. You know, I know what I like and I'll bring all these things here, including all the books that I love and we'll see how they do. And when I started traveling and I spent about six months traveling in Europe and Asia and the US, literally just going to every concept store I've for, heard for of. For that purpose, For yes. that purpose, to just look at concept stores. That is so you, the concept, uh, you know, having that kind of store. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I thank you. Well, I went and I, I went to places like Colette in Paris. I was like, oh my God, this has like a certain energy. And I started obsessively looking at all the products and all the things they have. And of course, it's good. It, 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 w it would fit Dubai, but not maybe other cities in, in yes. the Middle East. Yes. I thought Dubai would be a good place for that. Because of the multicultural exactly. aspects exactly. of exactly. the affluence of the city. Exactly. Right? And the hybridity. That's the first time I hear that word, hybridity. Yeah. I felt, you know, there's, we, we talk about this actually quite a bit here within the lighthouse culture. There's that hybridity. I mean, I felt I was a you know, child of obviously, you know, without kind of dramatizing it, but... Uh, that grew up in the East, I grew up in Egypt, uh, and but then also went to the States. I mean, it's not very un dissimilar to you. I, I was thinking about that this morning to, to tell you that we must all have a nationality in Bermuda because that's like maybe halfway. That's good. But it's not really. It's, it's just a concept I have in my mind. That you're never at home. No, you're yeah, no longer at home. So that's exactly right. And to that point, so when I left Egypt the first time, my mother told me, just keep in mind that from now on, you're very likely not to fit in anywhere. What a wise lady. I ain't forget no, I ain't for not type of thing. What a wise lady. And I think that happened for sure. And that's definitely how I felt. So I was like, well, if I have that hybridity, um, then I want to capture it. Use it. Use it. And then what I noticed in a lot of those uh, places that I went to was that they had food somehow as part of the concept because it attracted footfall. So Colette had a restaurant downstairs. Oh, really? I, I haven't been. There. Yeah, it was more of a canteen, but like very popular. Corso Como in, in Milan. Probably just to get you to stay a bit longer. I was bought to stay longer, to maybe... Have a coffee or... So I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe we should then think about food. Very simply. So we came oh, here. Okay, interesting. Back. Who's we? Uh, myself and Hani at that stage. Hani had joined you. Had just joined me. I see. Had joined me when we literally, as we were opening here, we had then spoken to uh, a, a chef friend, Izu, who had started some very successful restaurants, including he was the head chef at La Petite Maison, and then La Serre. And I went to him six months before and I said, I'm thinking of doing something in food, but I'm only going to come to you when I'm ready because I don't want to waste your time. Did you know him from before or did you approach him cold? I knew him from before, uh, from, from the days of LPM, because I was working at EFG in the same building, I mean, DIFC. Oh, okay. I knew him a little bit, but I liked him a lot, liked his energy and loved his food. And he was saying, when well, I'm leaving La Serre, I'm starting my own kind of consultancy, I'd be happy to work with you guys. He was very open to it. And he got it immediately. How timely? It was super timely and he got the concept. He got what we're trying to do. And to his credit, he built a menu that really spoke to the other side of that business. And he liked the idea that it had that hybridity and it had that dual element. And we opened here, sure enough, in this location, D3, uh, as a concept store and restaurant. Not restaurant. So, so just store. for the listeners, I, yeah. I need to explain you opened a restaurant concept store yeah. that you named The Lighthouse yeah. at the Dubai Design District, Yes, which was in, then in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, literally. What a risk you were taking. Yeah, and we were the first licensed concept in, 20, in 2017 and D3. We were the 
second, I think, concept in D3 period. So right at the, at the launch of D3. But the beauty is when you don't come from this business, right? It, it, you know, ignorance is bliss. You know, and people were like, I mean, why would you go to that side? I mean, at least go to like the spine. Cause Blind risk. Gonna be, Blind risk. Yeah, yeah, we were like, oh, no, I don't kind of like this location. It feels very lighthouse, you know? So 100%. And, you know, I was, we really spent as much time trying to understand, but there was no way for us to quantify the business risks. So we spent time doing what we knew how to do. I spent a lot of time on building the brand, the brand values. It's that expression, you build your parachute on the way down. Yeah, that's a great expression. Exactly. That's what you were doing. That's exactly right. So we spent a year working on the actual brand ethos, what the lighthouse means. A visually. year? A year. A total, of, total full year. I mean, I remember very well being in Sahel in the summer and calling uh, Lara, who was our uh, graphic designer working on the brand. I'd be like, Lara, it's been about five months. And, you know, and she, and Lara is a perfectionist and she now works for Apple and she refused to give us anything until it was ready. And I'm like, could you just send me something like a color or anything? And she was like, no, but if the lighthouse was an animal, what would be? I'm like, oh, stop it. You know, <laughs> she was just in this esoteric. And eventually she came up with it. And, and uh, I read in one of your interviews or articles that everyone on your team was, although they were not in a rush, they were working to a deadline. Yes, so it's like, it's like what I say, making cognac. It takes as long as it has to take yes. to perfect. It's a very good... So, so in, in, in the various yeah. elements of your... And we were all improvising. I mean, Farah was, was there at the time. She oh, remembers. really? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it was a presentation, which we all kind of clamored to, because it was the only thing we had. And anyone who, when we went to, to apply to get a brand to come here, I mean, there was nothing, right? So we literally had that presentation. And I learned that from EFG. Make sure your presentation, my first asset management presentation, I spent about a year on it. I need to perfect it because that's my calling card. It was the same thing. I what, what do you mean by presentation? Literally, the, the PDF, the, the micro, you know, the whatever, PowerPoint or whatever the you deck, want. What the deck, what they call now the, call the deck. The deck is all we had. So the deck had to work in terms of the values, the visuals, everything had to be. Because and this deck was for external people or for your own both, DNA? Both. both. It was a Bible for us. It's the Bible, and a checklist, yes. but it was definitely for external. And we had to make sure that deck was really telling the story. And that deck was super profound. So when we went to brands, there were big brands, you know, the Vitras of the world and all of these Italian brands and French brands, some of them very snobby. We only had that deck, but the deck was so good that they were like, oh, we'd love to work with you. We hadn't opened yet because we had to open with brands on board. Is, that, is, is the deck still true to form today? Yes. The deck Over the is, years? Yes, the deck has evolved somewhat, but the original presentation is still as there. As it should, as it and should. And we go back to it. There were elements there, timeless experimental, all of those were part and remain part of the DNA of the brand. The timeless aspect, I can't emphasize more. How, how do you define timeless? So I didn't want any, I needed something that withstands the test of time. Okay, so that's what I thought. Timeless would mean that I'd never get bored of it. Or yes. It takes me a long time to Not get bored. bored of it. So a, a menu that is not trendy, you know, so if people love avocado today just for the five minutes, I don't need to have it in my menu. I want things that will work today, tomorrow, etc. The design, interior design of the place, the elements literally had to be not something that you're going to get bored of. The products had to be things that work here. German pen, Kaweco. As good today as it will be in 10 years, I assure you. But you see nothing f funky about it. I mean, it's just very functional. Functionality was one of our ethos as well. Um, so while I like things to be pretty, they have to be functional. You quoted someone in one of your articles that says there's a sense of having a gasp when you see something. Gasp of delight, yeah. We use gasp that of the delight. Time. Yeah. And that's so fascinating because I think it works, worked for me, but I never knew what it was called. You know, when, when I have this feeling of delight at something, I know that's it. So, and that's what I like about The Lighthouse, about your books, your products, your food, is that there is that sense of delight. Thank you. Well, you know, so these elements really were guiding elements. So, I mean, uh, Maria Kalman, who's the person you're quoting, who uh, is a graphic designer and author, and had that little book about one of the design museums in New York. And it said in the book, you know, shouldn't everything that you see, you know, provide you with a gasp of delight? I'm misquoting, but, you know, essentially. And I was like, ah, that's, ah, that needed to be there. And, and, and those were became guiding principles. And, you know, to be very fair, 
we've stuck to all of these things. Because because it's it's like if if you fall in love with something, you're presenting your essence. You, you and your partner. 100%. So if you fall in love with something, other people will fall in love with it as well. Yes, I th- I hope so. so. I think they will understand your point of view. They may not completely agree with it, but they will see the soul. And that became even more important as we started expanding because one it was one thing to do this in for over four years in one location, perfecting it. Is is it much different than when you started? It's evolved, but I don't think so. I mean, Farah would laugh when we started. I took the first Instagram post. And then Farah took over when she came, God bless her. And she was like, you know, Hush, this is great, but you know, I'm going to remove these. You know, it was nice for about seven minutes, but now that we're going to be open to the public. I'm like, but well, you don't like my convoluted Egyptian shot in Cairo that doesn't mean anything and nobody will understand. So we evolved. I mean, we all agreed on the basic principles, but obviously each one of us was bringing in his signature. So, you know, Hani has certain points of view. Farah has certain points of view. You know, Chirag has a certain point of view in terms of this. They all come in. And, and I think that was very important to make sure that's collaborative. So my job was just to provide uh, the broad guidelines so that we don't go too much in a rabbit hole one way or the other. I need adherence for excellence. So that was very important. And Izo also was really helpful in the sense that he really demanded perfection from his team, culinary team. He would not put a dish on the table that wasn't excellent. And that state that kind of culture stayed in everything we do. Here's a six million dollar question. Oh, yes. You have this wonderful, warm, I call it, it's like a club, the lighthouse at D3. For me, I'm going to the yeah, club. I like right? that. It's my place. A club meaning it's my place. I, I go there, I know what to expect and it's like always good. And then you go and you do this crazy thing where you take the worst location <laughs> in Mall of the Emirates, where the concept before you didn't have a customer, literally, <laughs> for years and stayed open. And it's 10 times the size of the lighthouse. I don't know, five times maybe, whatever. And you take this risk. And even though you are relying, your concept relies on the atmosphere and uh, the, 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 you know, the creativity inside and the colors and the lighting, etc., and you take a place that's also open-ended. It's open air and it's in a hallway. And that you make it work. And you can't get a table. And it's fully booked, mashallah, yani, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Within a month of opening. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, this wasn't easy. So, I mean, there's a reason we didn't do anything for four years. Because a couple of things I didn't want to do. I didn't want to copy and paste D3. There was no point. D3 is D3. By the way, not many people would think like that. Because no, most know. people would think, oh, it works. Let me do it again and Cookie again. Cookie cutter, yes. It just didn't excite me. So we looked at a lot of different locations. This location was not an obvious one. Even people at Majd al-Futem at, at MAF thought we were a little bit crazy for, for wanting this versus other locations. Like, I mean, go next to the cinema, you know? I mean, I'm like, it's not Lighthouse, right? So you know, the old, you know the old live serial commercial, give it to Mikey. Yeah, you know, because nobody else will take it. Yeah, but you, you know what I mean? Like, D3, I mean, was a destination already. So I said, if I'm a destination and it's working, alhamdulillah, I can be within the mall a destination, but I need a location that works for us. What attracted me personally was the HM. So when I saw the natural light and I looked at the HM, which looked very Art Deco, by the way, so it's interesting that it was all for me visuals at the beginning. I'm like, oh, I like that. I think I can do something. Like a French myself. railway station. Exactly. Felt exact. Felt like Central Station in New York. I'm like, I can see myself having, I don't eat oysters, but having oysters there, you know? So that was my first thing. So I could see the potential and it looked not living up to its potential. So that was very that, attractive. That's very odd for me because I would have expected you to have wanted controlled conditions. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, and I, these I, are not controlled conditions. They're not at all. They're not at all controlled. And we, we saw that when we opened. I mean, there's no doubt... So that was number one. Number two, I live not too far from, from Mall of the Emirates, and I felt very strongly that the mall deserved really more options that are of a certain quality, and that myself and many others, like yourself, who like this mall a lot, because a lot of Dubai residents love Mall of the Emirates especially, um, go there and say, ah, if I only had one or two more places where I could eat. We actually go there time. and then go elsewhere to eat. Exactly, exactly. And I was like, we could create something. So I saw a, a, a thagra. I saw a, an opportunity and a gap. 
which is it's all about filling these gaps. And the rest was really up to us to build on our DNA from D3, but do something very different. And our team, including our design team, uh, did a great job. And partially we use also a design team that knew D3 very well. So, you know, I went to, to approach Tarek Zaharna, who is a friend and has TZ Architects. Tarek has his office in D3. So like yourself, he spends a lot of time in, 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 in uh, at TLH D3. That was very important because I knew that he, while we wanted a new translation, he needed to have the bones. And if you don't spend time in D3, meaning D3, uh, TLH D3, you cannot do that. And, and we really wanted that to happen. I think we did a successful job doing this, but it wasn't easy. And I literally spent hours with him in the beginning going through what seemed very boring, the values, this, even though he knew a lot of it visually. I wanted to be sure it's communicated, but differently. Uh, and because I feel our DNA is so rich in terms of content, we can do a constant reinterpretation depending on the location and the clientele. So that was really the idea behind well, MOE. You've, you've nailed it somehow. Thank I you. don't really know. It's like seeing a magician work and you don't know. <laughs> Actually, I know it because my uncle was a magician. But, you know, you, lo you look at a magician, you wonder. You get a sense of wonder. So uh, compliments to you and your team. Thank that you. Um, I go there. My grandchildren, it's their favorite place now. Less. If I go anywhere else, they get upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And um, and you've helped them all, actually. You've helped them I all. Love that. Not them all, them all. Yeah, and we adapted the menu. I mean, we understood we're coming in different environments. So you and I talked about this. You know, we added pizzas, for example, which is a huge success there. But those were dishes that we don't feel we need in D3, don't necessarily add that much value, but certainly within a mall environment where you have more children, more families. Um, and also an easier introduction to the lighthouse. You know, because the menu is a little bit more evolved. So it's not obvious to me that the first time in you're in a mall goer, you want to necessarily eat a tuna tartare. So that's fine. Start with that. But I'm going to try to rope you in over time. The, the menu is very interesting in the sense that many restaurants, you get used to the menu. Somehow your menu design, you know, of the selection of the different things that go together. Somehow there's always a discovery. Even though they've always been there, these yeah. items. It, yeah. it's, it's very good. No, I appreciate the that. And look, we work with the specials board, obviously, also. So for those that are like daily visitors, the specials board is something that really acts as a, you know... I, I um, noticed it recently, yes. Yeah, and it's a way to discover new dishes. And many of the dishes that we put on the specials board wind up being in the permanent menu, but you have to test them. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in this R&D concept, you know, and, and um, I think if you don't evolve, including your menu and your DNA, you, 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 you stagnate. You know, I, I, I come from the food media, not the restaurant business. So recently I learned um, when a menu is too well-defined in one theme in one area that is not your usual menu, you know, doesn't have some, you know, when you have a Milanese, that's kind of a grounding, you know, I know it's anchors. Or anchors. When a menu has no anchors. I agree with that. I can go once, twice, and then... I don't want to go again unless they change the menu. No, that's exactly right. And by the way, the same concept applies to a mall. I know it's funny. Uh. One of the reasons MAF, this mall is very successful, is they are very good at putting anchors. You have Carrefour, you have the Apple Store, you have the cinema, you have the ski slope. In various different locations, by the way, that force you to traverse the mall. Right, right, right. That is a anchors so that instead of going once, you will go a lot yes. and you will... Traverse. I think El Fotema are really the best mall operators yeah. around. And exactly the same to the menu. So I have to give you anchors across the menu, not just in one direction, not right. just in the salad bar or the mazza bar or the mains. I have to give you in every category so that when Yusuf is there, he does the journey and says, oh, okay, well, this familiar, this familiar, there's a penne, there's a milanese, maybe there's a burger, but let me also discover the beach. Or, or, or on the other side, if I'm inviting people, Uncomf I am comfortable that if they don't like some of the items, there are items that they would yeah. like. And, you know, for example, now on, on also on delivery, we have a vegan bundle. Those dishes were always there, but I realized that some people were struggling finding uh, some of those dishes. So let's highlight it for them. That's curation again, which is a bit of a challenge at Mall of the Emirates. D3, I can fully curate and control the environment, as you said. I had to think about this for MOE because the bigger chunk of the space is outside in a lar in an area that you really can create. We tried to do as much as we could, and as much as MAF would allow us in terms of design elements to curate the space, but you also don't want to stand out too much. So the only, not regret, but the only thing that maybe was a bit frustrating for me is that some people go, go eat, 
go outside, never actually go on the inside of it. That's a thing, yeah. Which I felt obviously something we not just spend a lot of time on. It's very much the ethos and you know the art and the People music. Don't, and yeah, because the, the outside is so big. So I, 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 I find myself almost embarrassed catching myself telling people that I take to, you know, for lunch at the lighthouse. Did you know they have a bookstore and they have articles from MoMA and you know they have toothpaste from Italy that you can't find Marvis. anywhere. Marvis. <laughs> Farah, Farah is a Marvis uh, fiend fan. Me, me too. Me, me too. too. Me too. I love it. I I love that the curation of the items like they satisfy my eyes. They satisfy my soul. And I wish you would do more of that. And and I hope what I really mean to say is. I hope you never stop doing that. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. Um, the, the, the concept store element is very important to us, both visually and as a part of the brand. And obviously, it depends on the location, how much we can do. What I meant is I hope you never, I know you by now that you wouldn't do that, but you never say that's not bringing in enough revenue in the, in the real estate. Yeah. No. I <laughs> because because it's part of the, it is. It's part of everything. You can't take it out. And I can't tell you how much fun I have with the book selection. I mean, that's the highlight of my year. I mean, I haven't traveled for a little while, but typically when I travel, my entire feed uh, of, of camera feed is full of pictures of books. And then I come home, I cut them down, I choose adult books, of lifestyle books, cookbooks, and then children's books, children's which are the books, most fun. Yes. Every day when I wake up and I look at the sales report, that's the first thing my eye goes on to, <laughs> to see which books were sold, just naturally. And it's probably the least important. In yeah, I mean, within the revenue base, it's probably not necessarily what's going to move the needle. But, but that's for the me, passion. Yeah. I'm like, oh, someone found this book? That's great. You know, and that's part of the fun. And then you have to have a team that also has fun with it. So whether it's, you know, social media or right. so that we accentuate these elements. And we know very well that that's not necessarily the first thing people come to. But how boring would it be if all we are showing you is just, you know, food or I mean, we just don't want to be. And like imagine a, if it wasn't there. Finally, as we wrap up, I, I want to ask you, how, how important do you think family is? You know, your partner, your wife, and the children, and the stability, and the support. I have a friend uh, from college, I think that answered your question, that says, Hash, um, and he talks about himself and me, and, and, and we were a group of, of boys, really, in school that were very close, coming from different places. All, all mostly married now with children, and he said, well, we all know that without them, we'd be sitting somewhere in a ditch, probably dead, and, you know, some people coming and being like, oh, look at that. So, I mean, that's a good idea. So I think it really is profoundly important. True. I mean, both, not just in terms of stability. Uh, I mean, for me, my relationship with, uh, with May is very important. It started a long time ago, and it's really uh, a friendship. So m more than anything else. And um, my parents had that. And that was very, very important to me. So I look at her honestly first as a friend before being a wife. Um, so I, you know, we, we like, we want to do things together. We, we have a com an ongoing conversation over many, many years. Uh, obviously having kids has brought in a lot of stability to us and it's a huge blessing. So I don't undermine that. And I want to just maybe add one last thing is that to me, I, I broaden up a little bit the concept of family now, since I moved to Dubai, we've been here almost 20 years, um, to include very close friends. You know, because we, none of us come from here. And I've learned to really adapt the concept of family, uh, both for me and for myself, that have been extremely helpful over the years. Okay. Um, and as someone who lost both his parents kind of in succession, I really have a lot of uh, um, respect for the role that plays. And it's one of the reasons I frankly didn't want to live in New York or in London for the rest of my life. I felt that even though my, pet, my kids are not from here, they, they are getting that rootedness that to me is, is very, very important. Yeah, I, th I think my, for in my case, my wife grounds me yeah. in the sense of she doesn't really care about my artistic up, ups and downs, right? Exactly. <laughs> What's for dinner? What are we going to do with the kids? And, you know, yeah, yeah. and that's very important, yeah. very important to you know, bring you down to earth. 100%, what seems mundane, which is really life yeah, when life. you think about it. I can't thank you enough for the honor no, to, you've you. given me to, to take your place and, and interview you. It's been a delight and a, and very nice uh, to get you. to know thank more you. about you're you, Asher. You're, you're a kind and generous soul and it shows and, and, and this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. 
A big thank you to our host, Yusuf Adib, for joining me this week. I'll be back to hosting again next week. Yuppie! By the way, Yusuf's most recent project is The Apprenticeship of Giuseppe Lupo, a serial novel that is available with a free subscription at yusufadeep.substack.com. Check it out and let us know what you think. This episode was produced by Chirag Desai and our content director is Farah Sharif. If you're listening to us for the first time, you can catch up on previous episodes at thelighthouse.ee slash podcast and follow us in any of your podcast players. We'll see you in two weeks.